What's up YouTube? Back with another video. Uh, was searching and came across this case. Um, over on the right. Is uh, Chan and Kristen. Over on the left. Is Chris. Uh, this couple was murdered back in 2007 uh, the carjacking gone wrong they were brutally raped and brutally killed so if you like this video and want to see more like this on my channel let me know and i'll download more of course leave some messages in the comments let me know what you think about it and don't forget the bell Every time I upload, you'll be notified. Of course, I'm, my understanding is that's going to be in these soon. So, with that said, let's go ahead and jump in this video. We had heard a report on TV about a body being found that was badly burned on the railroad tracks, but never did two blocks from where she was if they'd have just knocked on the door walked the streets we i don't we don't know if we could have saved her life but she wouldn't have sat there for two days in the trash can anybody that knew chris was his friend and and he had a smile that everybody just loved. Chris was an excellent baseball player. Good boy, good kid, worked hard, uh, had a lot of skills. Could have went on and played further if he had chose to. She was a typical girl. I mean, she wasn't perfect, nobody's perfect, but she was, never gave us any trouble, always did well in school. She was beautiful, but what made her even more beautiful was the fact that she was not stuck on herself. Shannon Christian was a 21-year-old student at the University of Tennessee. Chris Newsom was a 23-year-old trim carpenter. Both were still living at home and had just begun to date in November of 2006. One Saturday evening, they planned to go to a birthday party for a friend, but instead they decided to stay at Shannon's best friend's apartment to watch a movie. 12.35, the phone rang that night and he spoke to spoke to her on the phone. She called to check in to let us know that she was coming home rather than um, staying at Kara's that night. And I sat up and she never came home. We had not seen him since Saturday night, which that's, that's not unusual. He was 23 years old and he kind of came and went, you know, with not a whole lot of restrictions at that age. And uh, the way we discovered he was missing was Shannon's mother, Dina, called and said that Shannon didn't show up for work. In the early morning hours of January 7, 2007, Chris Newsom and Shannon Christian were carjacked and abducted from the Washington Ridge Apartments. They were held captive in a house on Chipman Street near the Waste Connections building. Both were brutally raped and beaten. Chris was led to the railroad tracks near the house, where he was shot three times, twice in the back and once to the head, execution style. Then his body was set on fire. On Monday, a body found on the railroad tracks was identified as Chris by a homicide detective who had known him through his son. Detective Snodderly says it's Chris. And we asked, well, how do you know? And he says, I recognized him by his eyes. Everything fell apart at that moment. All of his friends walked in. There must have been 15 or 20 of them come in all at the same time. And, and that just gave me such an eerie feeling. So I thought, why isn't Chris with them? And it just, it, it really put chills through me. I thought, you know, here's all his friends and he's not here. And it was, that was one of the hardest moments. I got a phone call, and it said, um, 
man, there, there, there's something going on up here at this house by the uh, trash place. And then I got another call that said um, that, he, that they thought that they had found her because, or somebody, because they were bringing in, um, there was an ambulance that had just gotten there. Shannon Christian was kept alive inside the house for several hours as her captors repeatedly raped and tortured her. A chemical substance was poured down her throat and on her body in an attempt to destroy DNA evidence. She was then bound, put inside five trash bags, and then shoved inside a trash can where she was left to suffocate. She died with her eyes open. Five people have been indicted in these crimes. Do you know how quick to Shannon and Chris that that char carjacking went down? You, you come down your stairs and you go get in the car and you are cranking your car and your boyfriend gets inside the door there, you're gonna get him a little sugar. There's a gun in the back of your head, and some big sucker gets in your forerunner and puts a gun on you, just like that. It's done. I've covered cops, courts, and crime in East Tennessee for about two decades now. Um, and this case is unique on a, for a, a number of reasons. It is unusual to have two victims. Um, it is unusual to have a stranger crime uh, in the sense that the victims and the defendants did not know each other. The level of violence is not as unusual, but, but a bit unusual uh, for the length of time that that violence was carried out. It's unusual in how it's gripped the community's attention. Um, and I think part of that is because you had two kids who were from fairly well-to-do families. Uh, who were not doing anything wrong. Uh, people look at this case and they think that could be me or that could be my kids. Uh, and so it touches people in that way. Waste Connections, which is located next to the house on Chipman Street, bought the property where these crimes occurred. In October of 2008, the house was demolished and a memorial raised to Shannon and Chris. There's been an outpouring of community support surrounding this crime. In the two and a half years since it occurred, there have been several vigils, fundraisers, and support groups formed. I have never done anything like this before. Everybody has someone in their family that dies, but they don't die like these families' children did. My heart just felt for them. We, we don't know what it's like, what they're going through, and anything that we can do. We've got a whole bunch of cards from people that don't know us that just have to say something and, and want to say something, you know, that they're praying for us. And, and uh, there's been an awful lot of support that we really appreciate. It really helps us get through. We took Shannon, just like Gary takes our children, as part of our family. So we have lost one of our children. The Shannon Gell Christian Foundation memorializes Shannon through a golf tournament and scholarship each year. And the scholarship is awarded to a female Farragut High School student attending the University of Tennessee, as Shannon did. We've had three golf tournaments in her name, uh, and we've given two scholarships. Every recipient so far has been so appreciative. A Little League Baseball tournament in Chris's honor is held each year in the Halls community, and a memorial scholarship is given annually to a graduating Halls High School student. He was honored at the baseball park, at the Halls um, High School baseball park. We put a plaque up in his honor. We give a scholarship in his name every year, and uh, that will continue as long as we're here. The online community at knoxnews.com responds with an outpouring of comments every time the News Sentinel publishes a story about this crime. Many have voiced frustration and indignation over the perceived lack of national media coverage. 
that's not entirely true. There has been some coverage. CNN did a piece. Uh, Fox News did some reporting. Although this case... It and I think that is a crime. There should have been more reporting on this. These idiots want to report nowadays about stupid crap. Uh, oh, they're protesting a such and such. And here we have two victims that were killed. Shocking to us and, and certainly unfamiliar territory for East Tennessee. It is not necessarily something that hasn't occurred similar in, in, in other parts of the country. They raped them, they tortured them, they beat them, then they killed them. It's not a normal murder. Certainly there has been discussion among uh, members of various groups, particularly white supremacy groups trying to use the case and the lack of coverage as... And that shouldn't even be broadcasted. I think when they come out and rebellion for this, these white supremacist groups, they ought to just not even video them or even say they were there because that's what they want is the attention. And there's some poor kid sitting at home that's probably abused by his parents or don't feel loved by his parents or has a sickness in the back of his mind about killing people and see these people and, oh, yeah, that's what I want to be and getting a bunch of ideas shoved down their throats. Uh, indication that it's because you have black suspects and white, and white victims. I have heard that there's been some, some people that have talked about how... Um, you know, it was a, a racially motivated crime, and I think that it's is not a bad thing because that just it was a, creates more a racism of and intolerance all and, and um, I guess, strife between in the community. I don't think it had anything to do with race. I think it was just they, that's who they saw and they went after him. From what we've read and what we know about some, some of them. This man here is genius because he knew some of the suspects. And I love what he says in this clip. Because some of the people in the community know some of the, the suspects that they've always had a life of crime. They were always unstable and they were always into something. And I do believe firmly and some of the people that I run along with that when you practice a lot of deceit and when you're involved in a lot of things like that, it's going to catch up with you. And I think it caught up with them. I don't believe that it had um, a negative effect on the African-American community as a whole because the African-American community is not responsible for the acts of a few uh, individuals who... And I myself think they are responsible because that is your people, as you say, and some of these people were raised up in the projects. A lot of them probably were born in the 80s of parents who did crack back in the day and, you know, didn't get the attention at home they wanted, so what did they do? They went out on the streets joining these gangs because that's what they want as a family. That's what they think they have, and they do that. There should be more done for people like these suspects. You know, there had to have been something that happened in their background. You know, they, they didn't just wake up one day and say, oh, hey, let's go carjack somebody and we'll, we're going to kill them and rape both of them. Went past the bounds of human decency. Whether we want to recognize it or not, a case like this sometimes exposes veins of racism that we kept hidden. I think a lot of people don't believe that things like that can happen here to them. And when they realize that, you know, there's monsters among us, they're coming in here, they want some protection. They want to know what to do to keep that from happening to them or their kids. Whenever we get a chance, we haven't had the chance yet, but we're going to go and get gun permits and carry a gun also. I just feel like, you know, you really need one now for security, and especially if there's a home invasion or something, you, you really need to be able to protect yourself now. We 
And I know all you social justice warriors are going to be down in the comments. But you know what? I think about it that if Chris had a gun on him and this guy stuck a gun to his head and he was able to get that gun out, even if he couldn't just shoot and injure the suspects or suspect that took them hostage, they probably could have ran off and the worst that would happen is Chris probably would have been shot and hurt. But he would be alive today. So I don't care what you say. I think a right to bear arms is the best thing you ever could do. I started a class just for women called Women on Target, and it's full almost every month. Most of the people that I know have a carry permit. But they didn't used to. They didn't then. They do now. I'm not talking about four or five. I'm talking about a hundred or more. Everybody I know, everybody that's close to us. I'm more cautious about what I do and where I go and my surroundings. Okay, and this girl here is about stupid. You can never, ever be cautious. You know... Leaving your house, as what happened with Chris and Shannon, you can never be that vigilant. And yes, again, a gun may not help you in the long run. It may hurt you more, but at least you have a chance. I'm very scared of like going out somewhere that I'm not um, aware of where I am. Since it happened, you know, you always got to be leery of everywhere you go anyway. So, you know, you got to be leery about people you meet and stuff that you do. I have a daughter, and I wouldn't want any, I mean, as a result of that whole thing, I'm checking up on her every day. The Christian and Newsom families have yet to grieve their loss. Instead, much of their time has been spent in courtrooms. They've committed to being present during every step of the trial process for each of the five suspects. Still, the memories of their children bring them strength and fire their determination. Two weeks before this happened, Chris had that motorcycle that um... And this right here is really, really heartbreaking. And he loved it. He, he rode it all the time. And we were always afraid for him when he rode the motorcycle. We didn't want anything to happen. And he knew that we were scared about him riding it. And he called me one afternoon and said, Mom, I've sold my bike. And I said, you have, Chris? I said, why did you do that? And he said, because I want a life. And that just haunts me now that he said that. And two weeks later, here he is dead. It just haunts me. I'd be sitting in that chair. And she would come. And this is right here. Y'all ought to pay close attention to this. No matter what anyone says, this wasn't racially done. It wasn't racial profiling. Nothing like that. This was a crime of opportunity. And always, the news always wants to make it, oh, whites against blacks. Oh, it was this. Oh, it was that. No. You know, we should focus on the suspects and why did they get to the point where they were? What happened in their lives that got them that way? But more importantly, it should be about the victims. You know, I mean, you'll see in this man's face. And his emotions, you know, and I would probably be the same. I bet a thousand times slide right over the arm of that chair and sit in my lap. She was so tall, long-legged, her feet still dragging the ground. But she would sit in my lap, put her arm around me, and look at me a certain way. Daddy. And I would get this feeling that would come over me like this is going to cost me. <laughs> if 
if I sat down in that chair and shut my eyes, I can feel her do it. And it sure feels good. And when I open them, I got a rage in me you wouldn't believe. I hate in me that ain't normal. still yet have to deal with it on our own and that is something that we're, we face day to day and for the rest of their lives these two families are going to be connected and something that happened that was so bad so heartbreaking for them we can't bring her back just always remember to tell your children that you love them, your family that you love them, because you never know when it's going to be the last time that you get to say those words. I was grateful enough to tell her that I loved her the day she walked out that door. Is and her daddy got to tell her he loved her that night. He talked to her. Because that was one thing that we always did. We let our kids know how much we love them. And to be careful. And you just never know when it's the last time. Well, that was it. YouTube. Hope y'all liked it. Um, if you like it, hit the like button, subscribe, leave me a uh, comment down in the comments. Let me know if you like this, if you want to see more. But as for me, I am going to go out. So I will catch y'all later. See ya.